Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Theosophical Society, and thank you to Roger Green for sponsoring us and the Academy of Healing Nutrition. Uh, and we'll, tonight we're going to talk about the uh, Therify device and a uh, little bit about uh, the history and what it's, uh, what it's all about and how it works and um, where, where our current status is with it and, and, and where it's going in the, in the future here. So um, how many people are familiar with the Therify here? So a few people have experienced it, been on there before? Yeah, a couple, yeah. Okay, good. And uh, how many people have seen some of my other talks on YouTube and things like that? Okay, good. Yeah, that's good to know because I'm, I'm not going to go, like I've done extensive talks on the whole history of electromedicine and, uh, and various uh, things in the, in the past. So now we're going to bring you up to speed with where, uh, where this particular uh, technology is. Uh, right now. So uh, basically the Therify uh, consists of these two uh, plasma tubes and you basically lay on the table uh, in between them and you become uh, part of the circuit. So uh, it's inductively coupled. So you're isolated from the electrical mains through induction coupling uh, that happens through uh, a medium-sized Tesla coil, and it produces a, uh, an electrostatic uh, field around there. And the whole uh, premise in, in making this device was to see if we could uh, find out if uh, this particular frequency algorithm that this is running uh, creates a bioactive field. So it interacts with the, with the human body, basically. And uh, the algorithm um, was basically uh, conceived by uh, Dan Winter and uh, the, uh, at the core of the machine is, is utilizing that frequency. So unlike other uh, devices where you can use lots of different frequencies and uh, th things like that, this has one p particular set of a, of a complex waveform that's, that's being uh, utilized here. And so we put it out there about two, three years ago and uh, to see if anybody wanted to experiment with it. It is a, an experimental uh, research device and uh, uh, lo and behold, many people were very interested in it. And once, uh, once the word started getting around about some of the effects that people were having with it, uh, it, it became quite popular. So now there's several of them all over the world. Uh, close to a hundred different places and uh, some private and, and some clinics uh, and in a lot of different settings and people are using it in a lot of different uh, modalities which has really been interesting so in essence we didn't really dictate that it's going to be for any particular one thing it was really just to see what kind of results we were getting uh, and some of the uh, reports that part of the, the agreement that we have with people is they give us some of the reports on, on the effects they're seeing. And we've seen a wide gamut of range of effects from people with uh, pain, uh, all the way people are working with it with uh, children with ADD. Uh, they're, uh, we use it as a general part of our longevity protocol. Um, there are people that are processing oils with it. They're using, uh, processing uh, cannabis oils. Uh, people are growing uh, plants. Uh, there's another uh, group in, in Norway who's uh, processing fish oils with it. They're, they collect uh, this rat fish oil, it's like a cod liver oil kind of thing. And they, okay. so what they're saying with the oils is interesting. They say it increases the bioavailability they find and, uh, and uh, the, the overall energetics of the product. So it's, uh, I've, I'm a herbalist and I, I work with a lot of different uh, plant medicines uh, over the years and I've really noticed that anytime you have anything that contains uh, alcohols and, and oils, uh, they're particularly uh, well uh, programmable. Unlike water, which is very difficult to program. I mean, water programs very easily, it just doesn't hold very long. So it's really easy. We've done a lot of experiments recently 
uh, with water and the Therify device that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, but what I've found is that it's always been easier to uh, imprint things with alcohol. So if you think about homeopathics and what we've been doing, you know, since Samuel Hunnaman's and going back to Paracelsus, uh, originally this idea of imprinting uh, frequencies of other things into something small that you can take, in a, like in a homeopathic dosage, is basically just a diluted form. So if I wanted to imprint, and you could do... Uh, very poisonous things in large doses. Uh, you know, there's this saying that says, you know, it's it's all in the dosage, whether something is poison or or a medicine. Uh, so, and in homeopathy, we'll take something like uh, even something uh, very poisonous that would upset your stomach, like uh, arsenic or something, and we dilute it down and do these one concentration, so you take a particular volume, put one drop in it, and then you take one drop out of that and put it into another container of the same volume, and so on and so on and so on. And you might do it a hundred times, you might do it a thousand times. And in the end, there's no traceable elements of that original arsenic in there, but it has the energetic uh, frequencies of it. And so what uh, Hahnemann found was in, when he was riding in his uh, uh, he'd put his medicines in the back of his wagon in the old days and riding his horse and buggy uh, to go out to treat his, his clients is that those medicines worked better because they were uh, succus. They were, uh, there was a shaking motion that took place. So as you, what you do is you potentize these homeopathics. Um, and so with the Therify, it has a similar effect when being able to imprint those electronic frequencies. And as I say, that always worked better for Hahnemann and everybody when they use like a lactose-based uh, substrate or alcohol uh, and they and oils, they, they held the, the imprint better. Um, so basically there's a long history of electrotherapy and you can see some of my other uh, lectures online where I talk about uh, various characters throughout history. Um, so. I've been working with these kind of devices for several years. Back in the 90s, um, I got involved in uh, building uh, Rife type machines. And uh, Rife was one of these uh, people who found uh, in the early days uh, that these uh, different wavelengths and different frequencies had effects on various pathogens. And, uh, he called this uh, discovery that he made uh, a mortal oscillating rate. Uh, so he would take different viruses and bacteria and then produce RF frequencies through a plasma tube and he found that he could actually destroy those uh, viruses and bacteria and other pathogens uh, by hitting what he called this mortal oscillating rate. So that's how I kind of got uh, started into this whole thing and, and had been building these kind of machines for a long time and a lot of people ask, because Rife machines are quite popular. There's all, a whole gamut of them out there on the internet. They're all uh, um, quite interesting and, and somewhat unique, but they're all based on the same principle, where you're driving a single frequency, your wave, and you're exciting a plasma, and it's always a, a single tube of plasma. Uh, and then there's the handheld devices, which John Crane was Royal Rife's, uh, worked with Royal Rife. He sort of popularized those in the early days and then it became known as the Hilda Clark. She wrote about it and you heard about the Hilda Clark Zapper. Um, and then they're more like a handheld device where you actually put the electricity through your body. Uh, but where I was using this uh, plasma tube. Uh, so I became interested in that. And then a lot of people ask, well, what's the difference between a Rife machine and, and the Therify? And so these Rife machines work on these particular uh, frequency sets that people found sort of empirically over time. Uh, testing different frequencies on a standard carrier wave. Uh, and they would, you know, write down that oh, oh, it had a good effect for a particular ailment. And uh, so I look at the Rife machine as sort of being a destructive thing. You're out to destroy these viruses or bacteria or various other pathogens, whereas the Therify is a constructive device. Uh, because it's utilizing uh, the algorithm uh, of Dan uh, Winters based on Planck's length and, and, and the golden mean ratio, um, that those th uh, numbers basically or ratios and frequencies come from nature. So it's utilizing these uh, 
signatures that come from nature. We see uh, golden mean everywhere in nature. You're all familiar with um, phi ratio and the golden mean. And uh, so it, it's a constructive device. It's giving a life force. So it's, it's kind of the opposite uh, to what Rife was doing. And another one of the uh, main characters we looked at over the years uh, was Anton Perori in, in France after uh, Royal Rife um, sort of career ended and he ended up getting swept under the carpet and, and for a long time nobody heard about these things. It got erased from the uh, textbooks and back in the early 1900s uh, in any of the medical uh, textbooks there was always a good few chapters on various different uh, electromedical uh, treatment devices and nowadays we use them uh, electromedicine is mostly in diagnostics so we know we have EKG we can look at your heart electroencephalograms we look at your brain waves and all kinds of diagnostic tools MRIs and we've got really advanced but we focused on uh, uh, diagnostics and and sort of eliminated the treatment thing now recently there's been like the TENS machine and uh, everybody's seen the Dr. Ho commercials where he has the electrical pulsar to stimulate your muscles and things like that. So there's a couple of them out there, but really it's been sort of an esoteric uh, science since most of that stuff got swept under the rug. And Anton Perori was another example that the French government put millions of dollars into research in what he was doing with his RF equipment. And you can see, like Rife, he had a, a vast array of RF uh, equipment and very high-powered uh, tube amplifiers. And, of course, back in those days, uh, the electronics has, has changed a lot. So to do what he was doing with this whole room full of uh, radio equipment now, uh, everything, of course, has been miniaturized. So that's the nice thing about the Therify is it's all condensed down into uh, a small box. But the main uh, drivers in there uh, weren't even possible. Like it would have been Tesla's dream to be able to switch such high currents as we can do now with modern uh, MOSFETs and transistors and things like that. So it's really been an evolution of all of that. And there's, there's a lot of stuff that I've said in the past about it. So tonight I'm going to focus more on uh, defining some terms and and getting into a lot of people, you know, just are asking, you know, what's the simplest way to describe how the Therify works when they're working with clients and things like that. So uh, the number th one thing is to understand uh, what a, a biofield is. And uh, I've taken this definition uh, from a paper uh, that's basically called an overview of biofield devices um, written by uh, David Musham and a few others, and uh, they defined the biofield really well, so I like to use this definition. It's basically an organizing principle uh, for the dynamic information flow that regulates biological function and homeostasis. So homeostasis is uh, when the body is trying to maintain a balance in, in, in maintaining regular normal function. And when you experience dis-ease, uh, your homeostasis is taken off balance and we have to restore the order, uh, which is what we're uh, doing with the Therify. So, biofield interactions can organize spatial-temporal biological processes across a wide hierarchy of levels, uh, from the subatomic, atomic, molecular, cellular, organismic, to the interpersonal, interpersonal and cosmic levels. Uh, so you can see how it scales in this, you know, vast uh, range. Uh, as it is above, so it is below the old alchemical staying. And when you find these uh, particular paths, like the golden mean is, you'll see that it is, because it's a ratio that kind of goes inwardly, infinitely, and outward, uh, we can ride that wave uh, from the macrocosmic to the microcosmic. So it influences a variety of biological pathways, including biochemical, neurological, uh, cellular processes related to, it's related to electromagnetism and correlated to quantum information flow. Uh, so this is another key thing about hitting that particular wave is then we find that we can go uh, and tap into this quantum information flow uh, where You've heard of things like uh, what Einstein called the spooky action at a distance, and we find all these quantum 
uh, effects uh, happen. And we've had quite a few experiences with the Therify in, in this realm. And really what it comes down to is being a, able to uh, maintain a vitality, like a life force, a vital energy. And all throughout history, we've got a huge, uh, every, in every culture, we have words for that. And it's always been the goal of the, of the physicians uh, and the uh, philosophers and the, and the Taoist priests. And you know, in every culture had their own way of, uh, and way of terming it. And, and what they were searching for was this life force, basically. So in Chinese, you hear of chi. In uh, Hinduism, it's uh, prana. In Hebrew, it's the Ruach, and in Egyptian, Aka. And it's basically been achieved through breathing, meditation, uh, good food, good air, laughter, loving, uh, passion, just living a fulfilled uh, life. And uh, treating your body as, as, and your mind as, as best you can. And that's the way to achieve uh, vitality. Uh, so what we're doing with the Therify is basically uh, adding this charge to your body. And when you think about it, when people say things like, oh, I feel really drained, I feel drained of energy, so they compare, I have no energy. Uh, they're comparing themselves to a battery. Uh, so it's a similar thing. The body is basically like a battery, and one of the uh, pet names I have for the Therify is the human battery charger. Uh, because essentially what it's doing is creating this huge electrostatic field around your body, uh, and the potential on these tubes, because it's uh, a large uh, Tesla coil in there, it's actually putting about 300,000 volts of, uh, of uh, voltage in, into those tubes. Now, it's, uh, it's not a, as much a current phenomenon because the current is very, very low. So it's not like an electric chair where you're going to stick your hand on there and, and get electrocuted. Uh, it's an interesting feeling that you feel this electrostatic charge around you uh, when you get close to it. But uh, basically, we, uh, as long as you stay within a few inches of the tubes, uh, you're enveloped in that field and you become part of the circuit. So you're basically like a, a capacitor in the circuit. And there's been all kinds of different electromagnetic healing type devices over the years. Uh, electromagnetic uh, frequencies in, in the light uh, spectrum. Uh, in the heating uh, spectrum where you actually have like RF uh, heating, uh, magnetic uh, spectrum, you have uh, huge magnetic fields, magnetic pulsars, these kind of things, uh, non-thermal electromagnetics, uh, um, electrical current, straight electrical current like the, like the zappers or the, uh, the spooky two is sort of a good uh, version of the uh, modern uh, Rife type uh, thing, a handheld device. Um, vibration and sound, uh, physical and mechanical uh, devices, uh, intentionality and non-locality. Now there's an interesting one because that's part of the uh, process. We've worked with a number, a number of people have worked with this uh, doing remote um, uh, treatments basically where you have like sort of a witness and similar to a psychotronics machine or something like that. You have a a picture of somebody and with your intention you put them, there's just their picture on the table and they can be a thousand miles away or, or light years away. Um, there's a quantum entanglement uh, that is created by the what we call the witness, uh, their particular picture and through the intention of the operator um, somehow on the other end people uh, seem to get uh, effects and feel the effects of the Therify. And then the last one on there is gas in plasma. Uh, the Therify is sort of a combination of all of these particular modalities, which makes it quite uh, unique as well. And uh, basically what it comes down to is the body uh, and everything in the whole universe is basically, you know, you've heard about the bodies, all the different electrical potential in the bodies when we're looking at uh, EKG and we're looking at your heart rhythms and brain waves and stuff. These are all electrical pulses. So there's all kinds of frequencies, and the body is very, very complex. We don't even, you know, as much as we know in our medical literature and as much as we've been studying about everything uh, to deal with the body, we barely understand half of the processes in there. We're just, there's been a lot of amazing developments lately where we're discovering how the mitochondria 
work a little better and, and how that much energy the mitochondria is creating in the body. Um, the entire universe, it's all put purely electrical phenomenon. When you get down to the core of biology, uh, physics or chemistry, it's all about the charge and it's all a balancing acts, so all balancing charge. Um, so there's this uh, concept of the electric universe and uh, there's a Thunderbolts project that you can look up online and get all kinds of great information how uh, we live in this um, amazing electric universe and when you see it uh, from very fine things like these neurons in the top picture here uh, to a computer-generated uh, image of the, uh, the omniverse, basically. This, every point of light is connected through these light tubes, um, and it's all plasma, which is very interesting. So you see how these fractal patterns repeat itself. So it's, everything is fractal and everything's recursive. So it happens from a very small scale down to a, a subatomic uh, nanostructures all the way up to uh, these large structures and so 99.9% .9 of the universe is uh, plasma and plasma isn't anything real uh, special We're, we've understood it for a while we call it the the fourth state of matter um, it's basically anytime you cr increase the charge on uh, atoms especially if they're very loose atoms like atoms in the air uh, they all ionize and the electrons will get stripped off the outer shells of the atoms and you have uh, ions and, and electrons and they, and they float around in this gas and every time the, those electrons jump off the outer shells they release uh, photons. So it's photonic emission and that's what you're seeing as, as the glow. And this is part of the creative process of the universe. And when we talk about uh, fractality, uh, we see it, and here's a really good example how we're just living in it and we don't even uh, realize it until we take a look and go, hey, isn't that amazing? Because this is a, a picture of a neuron uh, on the right and uh, a city, I think it's LA, uh, from above, and uh, you see how this fractality, we're just repeating these patterns as we build the city without even realizing it we are just part of nature, so much so that we're just emulating these repeating patterns that happen over and over again. Uh, so this same picture of the, of the universe or omniverse with millions of universes in there, uh, computer modeled and in a comparison to a mycelium mat that is like fungi growing underneath the soil and how the fungi are basically like the internet of, of the forest and the, of the whole earth. The, the fungi are connected to everything, all the plants and everything in there, all the bacteria, they're all working together. One of the f mistakes we've made as, uh, as <laughs> humans is, especially in agriculture, is we said, oh well, you know, we got a, a fungus that's destroying our plants and these insects are eating the plants, so we've made fungicides, insecticides, pesticides, genocides to the soil, uh, you name it, uh, and we've created these monocultures and we've wiped out that substrata of mycelium that is basically the communication uh, in the plants. And now we're realizing with permaculture and how we can restore uh, the lands and actually grow back the soil, grow back the uh, bacteria, because uh, they're all working together under the ground. All these mycelium are connected to the roots, they call it a mycorrhizal relationship. The plants are producing sugars, to feed the fungi. The fungi are breaking down elements in the soil and transporting them along these networks and feeding the trees. And they're all working together and the bacteria play a, uh, an important role in all this. So here's another good uh, fractal mirror. This is the internet of the earth and how, look at how it looks just like a mycelium growth. So we've created these networks through, you know, communication systems and fiber optics and copper wires and uh, so everything in nature, uh, including us in, internally, when we look in, we see these fractal relationships uh, everywhere. So one of the things that we talk about a lot in how the Therify works is uh, phase conjugation. And uh, phase conjugation, um, you know, Dan's been talking about phase conjugation for, m for many years, and it can get pretty complicated, but to try and simplify it, I kind of 
came up with this uh, uh, combination of what Tom Bearden had been talking about and what's you know available on uh, in modern literature on electronics and uh, and uh, basically it's a it's a phase conjugation is a physical uh, transformation of a wave field where the resulting field has a reverse propagation direction but it keeps its amplitude in phases. So what's happening is is a is a phase conjugated array that's happening with these two tubes. And they're 180 degrees out of phase and you can change those phase angles uh, to make the phases intermesh and where they meet uh, is this phase conjugation. And your body is actually part of the circuit. And uh, because it's a nonlinear medium, you have like denser bones in your body to soft tissue and uh, all these different densities within the body, it creates a nonlinear medium. So as we'll see in, in, the, in a bit here, well, we're creating these longitudinal waves uh, with the plasma because the plasma is a really good propagator of longitudinal waves. Uh, the body acts like the phase conjugate mirror and it spans a wide, span of frequencies because we're not, remember we're not working with a single frequency here, we're dumping a whole complex array of frequencies in here. So basically uh, your body is converted into this phase conjugated uh, pumped uh, mirror, so we call it a phase conjugate mirror uh, that resonates with the therify frequencies. Yes, because there's not just a single frequency. Remember, it's a complex waveform that's Can being. You nanometers? Uh, yeah, well, frequencies basically go from. If you were looking at a nanometer type frequency, it's beyond what we even know. When we're getting into, uh, you know, into gigahertz, which are very high frequencies, very low frequencies, they can be miles long. And that's why when you, in the old days, when we only had lower frequencies in the radio spectrum, we had to make long antennas. Mm -hmm. And so you put up a dipole antenna and it's 10 meters long, you'd say you're in the 10 meter uh, uh, band uh, for frequencies, but when you realize those low frequencies are so long, we we're picking harmonics in those antennas. So you, whatever length your antenna is, you're usually within a, uh, a harmonic of the, of the wavelength. So yeah, exactly. Uh, it goes down from about 0.3 hertz up into the kilohertz range. So, which is quite a range. So when you look at those things, you know, in the early days when I was looking into Rife, I'm like, well, gee, how can these frequencies that are in the megahertz and then you're putting different pulses on the, on the carrier wave, how can they even affect material so small because those wavelengths are way too long. Like it, as soon as we started getting into modern day cell phones and microwaves and things like that, into the gigahertz, yeah, well, laser goes into the light spectrum, which is very small. So that's when we get into the nanometers, once we get up to light. But up to then, you think about gigahertz, you know, your microwave is, you know, running at uh, 1.2 gigahertz, that's, you know, the, those wavelengths are still quite long, about this long. And until we get into the terahertz machines like we have in the airport scanners and things like that, that's when we're starting to get this smaller and smaller. But there's no way we're down into those uh, nano uh, micron scales unless we're dealing with light. So light's a component, but if you remember what I said about everything being uh, a harmonic of it, so how antennas are uh, in harmonics and one of the people we based part of this design off of was uh, George's uh, Lakofs Lakofsky and uh, he called his machine a multi-wave oscillator so it was kind of close he had no control of those frequencies he just knew they were multi-waves and all kinds of frequencies were coming out of those antennas but when you look at your DNA even though uh, it's only like um, so very small, uh, a couple atoms wide, uh, when you unravel your DNA into this long uh, chain of your, what your DNA is, it's each, strand, each uh, part of your DNA uh, will unravel to about two meters long. And you have so much genetic uh, DNA material in your body, if you were to take your DNA in every cell and every other cell that's in your body, because your body's mostly not human cells, it's other things, um, 
nine tenths of your body as other life forms that aren't human. Um, and 99% of your DNA is not human DNA. Uh, but when you <laughs> take all those, and even if you just took the, the human ones, and you stretched them all out end to end, they would wrap around the circumference of the solar system. So that's how, you know, your DNA is basically like a fractal antenna. And that's part of how the interaction is working with these. So in this phase conjugation concept, we, this is a phase conjugate mirror, and you can picture it like a pop bottle. If you looked at an image through the pop bottle, it's a distorted image. But if you had a, a conventional mirror on the other side, that image is going to be twice as distorted going through there. But if you had a phase conjugate mirror, it will restore order back into the picture, the original picture you're seeing. So that's how you have to look at the Therify uh, and that's how it's restoring order in, in the cell. Uh, so when you get into going back in time through these time reversal waves that we'll talk about in a second, the cells will only go backwards to their more coherent state as well as your genes. They'll, uh, it's like a genetic uh, repair uh, mechanism. So this is another thing that we talk about is these time reversal waves. And time reversal signal processing is uh, a technique of focusing waves. And um, we call it a time reversal mirror, uh, which is basically what a phase conjugate mirror is. And it, it's a device that can m focus these waves. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you an example here in a second. Uh, and it's been known for years in the optical domain. We've used it with lasers. Uh, phase conjugating lasers and creating time reversal waves in optics. We use it in signal processing uh, for the internet, fiber optics, and signal repeaters uh, as a way to, you know, clean the noise out of the signal. So when you transmit a signal over a long distance, uh, by the time it gets there, it's somewhat distorted and it has a bunch of other noise in it. So we use a time reversal uh, process in the receiver to clean up the signal. And so, we're using the body as a time reversal mirror. And uh, this way, the Therify enables these cells to restore themselves to the more coherent state. Um, now I have a video here uh, that I'm, I'll show. But I, what I'll do is I'll actually do a live demonstration. Because what I'm going to show here is uh, how uh, the Therify interacts with uh, uh, plasma to create these longitudinal uh, waves. So if this person's done, we can, uh, we can do it uh, live. Is it good to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so generally what our protocol is with people is we, uh, we put them on there uh, in duty cycles. So uh, the, the actual sessions are, consist of little blocks of when the uh, Therify is on. So we'll generally um, do a process uh, called uh, muscle testing or uh, kinesiology to get a feel of where, how much that person needs uh, in, in the field. And we test them and it's usually like three, six or nine minutes is about the longest. And what we found is that even after switching the machine off, because the machine conditions the space, and we've done this with spectrum analyzers in the room, and of course you see the 60 hertz uh, noise that's just prevalent everywhere, uh, and you see all the Wi-Fi and all kinds of other electromagnetic pollution that we're more and more bombarding ourselves with as we make more RF uh, um, equipment that's running all around us. You look at it on a spectrum analyzer. If you, if you were to go out in the middle of nowhere and where there's no signals and turned off all the satellites, and I'd get lucky enough to live out in the middle of a forest, so I can test this now and then. And I'd, I have equipment so sensitive sometimes, I have to wait till the power goes down. And when the power goes out, I run to the lab and I grab all my battery powered an analytical equipment and I look at all the background noise. And so, background noise of the cosmos is kind of just like a flat. It's like white noise. You see all these peaks of every different frequency, and that's like just stuff that's being bombarded from the cosmos, basically. Um, 
And whenever you turn on something that's transmitting a frequency, you'll see it on a spectrum analyzer as a peak, and that peak will pop up. So uh, whatever, they are, if it's a Wi-Fi router or something like that, it's going to be at 4 uh, gigahertz or 5 gigahertz now we're going into, you'll see that peak. Um, and what uh, ideally, uh, we, when we look at a room like this, we see all kinds of noise. We see the 60 hertz, we see all the Wi-Fi's and things like that. And when we run the Therify, you'll see the spectrum analyzer pick up the Therify's main carrier wave and then all the other frequencies that are on it are sort of amplitude modulated on that single frequency. But you'll see a lowering in, uh, a raising of the noise floor and a lowering of all the other frequencies that are around it. So the Therify is kind of over uh, riding those frequencies and uh, when it's on and then when we switch it off interestingly enough that other frequencies don't come up as, as much and it's the, the room stays conditioned to what the frequencies are coming from the Therify. So one of the ideas that I have is it's conditioning there's an old concept that we kind of threw away in science, but we're getting back to realizing that there is uh, this thing called the ether. And so what I say is that the Therify is creating these spin fields that we'll talk about in a bit, and it's conditioning the ether, and those fields hold even when it's, when it's off. So I can show you an example of uh, what we uh, talk about a lot is longitudinal waves. So it, you have this uh, in a, an electromagnetism uh, we have these Hertzian waves where you get particular frequencies and you usually see it as a sine wave like this. And a longitudinal wave is something that can be pushed through a medium and is moving. Like my voice traveling through the air is creating a longitudinal wave that's resonating your eardrums, right? So, yeah, you can just turn this up. Um, so because we're creating this electrostatic field, um, we can sense that with this tube. And this could be even a burnt out uh, fluorescent tube. But when you come near uh, the, the device and you come towards the coil, uh, there we can see uh, it lights up just by proximity. So when Tesla was talking about wireless power transmission, well, we're doing it here. So when people say to me, oh, there's no energy in, in this field, they're just light bulbs that are lighting up. This is how I show them, I say, well, you tell me where the, what, what's happening here when, you know, I'm out here. So now you see these waves here. These are longitudinal waves. And you see how, uh, how I, I, I am affecting it. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people try to gra grasp, you know, what are these longitudinal waves? Well, here they are. And we can even show you the time reversal waves because we can make time reversal waves within this fluorescent tube here. So as you see, the field varies, and it's basically uh, like a spiraling field that comes out of these tubes. The tubes are specially designed to spin, so that plasma is spinning. Uh, and then, so here we have all these nodes, and so you see how your body affects the field. You see, I can turn it down and I can control uh, the field. So when we talk about metallic objects and why you shouldn't have large metallic objects in the field, I mean, having things like this where we've got it set up, although it's not ideal, there's a distortion that's happening around the, uh, if I was to let go of this, and I, I could show you the field effect, and we could probably do this with the Shakti stone, uh, is what I was doing to look at it with the, with the tube on there. But basically, you're, you picture yourself lying on the table, and I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get to do this. I'll try to, because it's a bit short, but I'll try to keep it going. No, nope, there we go. All right, so now you see how at the zero point right at the center, the waves are moving outwards. They're moving inwards and outwards at the same time. But what's important is this zero point right here because that's where the waveforms are collapsing. So when that charge collapse happens, and that's generally when you're on the table right about your Dan Chin, uh, you're getting, uh, your body's absorbing those fields because these you look at these uh, tubes as being two buckets of sloshing water that are going back and forth like this. Um, and, and because one's high when the other one's low, it's 180 degrees out of phase, we say. So if you've got plus 10 on one side and minus 10 on the other, and you add them together, you get a zero point. And that zero point 
is right here. So that's where this scalar potential comes in uh, from the, uh, you've heard people talk about scalar waves and it's big in the new age community where people are making pendants and things like this. But to really understand what, uh, you know, what, what, what a scalar wave really is, the way to understand it is that these longitudinal waves uh, cancel each other out. And Dan talks a lot about the pine cones kissing, right? So you picture those Hertzian waves. And as they get closer together, they get lower and lower and lower in amplitude till at the zero point, they cancel each other out. And that's where the null point is and the scalar uh, field uh, effect is from there. So we talk about scalar waves. It's more like a, a field effect, but because we can see the longitudinal waves, it's a really good uh, way of, of just visualizing it. And then to get the time, to see how the time reversal waves are working, um, you might see waves bouncing back here. So you see them hitting towards the end and then you'll see some coming backwards going the other way if I get this in just the right spot. So you slow it down there. Okay, so now you see these short ones that are bouncing off the end and, and coming back. So the longitudinal wave is moving this way, and when it hits the end, picture that as the time reversal mirror, and the time reverse waves are, are coming back. So your body is actually just part of the, the, the you, it's like the tube. So for all the people, <laughs> yeah. so for all the people, all these years who said, oh no, there's nothing in Arizona, I go, okay, well, here it is. It's there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so plasma, um, I said a little bit about it uh, before. What's really interesting is plasma is able to uh, conduct electricity because it, once it ignites like that, it's not conducting, it's not a conductor when it's off, but once it's activated like that, it becomes a very good conductive medium. And uh, I've done many talks on, on plasma, but let's just look at it as uh, being an antenna because essentially uh, it's a, a, an antenna, uh, special form of plasma fractal antenna that the tubes is what the tubes are. And so this has been used in the, in the military as a stealth antenna because when you're, when you're uh, transmitting a signal and uh, you know radio frequencies uh, have been long held by the military as part of their secrets and how they encode things and all the frequencies and stuff and it's just been an evolution of of uh, military to they always have had radio people uh, Anton Perori was a military uh, Navy radio guy uh, so they came up with this plasma antenna where because when you turn off your transmitter and you still have your antenna up in the air well somebody else can hit that same frequency and scan the area and they'll ping your antenna and go ah there they are right there uh, so they came up with a transmitter that is a, a plasma antenna because once that plasma field collapses it's no longer a conductor so it's invisible now it's a stealth antenna they can't find you in the in the bush anymore or wherever you are right it's also uh, doing some unique things within this tube itself. It's designed so uh, the plasma spins. So the earlier versions of the, uh, uh, the tube had uh, electrodes internally. Now they're uh, inductively coupled on the outside. Uh, but the whole point of the, and, uh, this particular shape and it's all phi ratio too, like phi is built in everything from the coils to the tubes to the algorithms and the amplifier design. It's all golden mean. Uh, so if you look at a point on a pentagram, which is like the perfect example of golden mean, you have the 72 degree angle on one of the arms of the pentagram. And that is exactly what the uh, tubes are based on. And the Russians did a lot of uh, experiments building pyramids in that particular angle and found it particularly good for agriculture and healing and treating water and doing all kinds of interesting things. So what's happening in there is each of the electrodes is spinning and there's a braid on a braid. So it's spinning out of here and it spins in the tubes. Um, so it's creating this uh, vortexing field in the plasma, which is what the uh, pyramid does itself. I'll show you at the end 
of some metallic pyramids we've been making in the same uh, geometry and uh, very interesting effects and there's a lot of literature uh, that the Russians have been working with and they've gone so far as to build massive uh, pyramids in the fields and very interesting things happen. They have a huge growth rate in plants. They have this dormant seed germation, uh, germ germination where plants that have gone extinct for a long time started appearing around these pyramids. So you remember the whole time reversal concept? Uh, so th this, thing, this stuff has, has been documented and uh, Russia's always been, you know, out there. I asked uh, Konstantin uh, Karakov one time, you know, why, why do Russian scientists get to do all this fun science where you guys get to do all this crazy esoteric stuff? And he said, oh, basically in Russia, we got to do whatever we want because we're getting paid either way, so we decided we could do what we want. But in America, you have to get uh, sponsored by your chemical manufacturing company or drug company or whoever it is that funds the research, so they only want you to look down this one tunnel. But in Russia, there was nobody dictating that to them, so they got to do uh, what they wanted to do, which is quite fun. So this vortex uh, phenomenon, again, we see everywhere in nature, often golden mean, expressed in these uh, uh, spirals. Uh, everything in the universe is moving in a spiral. There's no such thing as a straight line from subatomic particles all the way up to the, obviously, we look at a solar system. Everything is moving and everything's spinning. And uh, it's part of the, the glue that holds everything together. Um, all moves in, in the spiral uh, pattern. And so water has been one of my uh, hobbies for a, lo a long time. I worked with water uh, back in the 90s, in the early days with the Rife machine, and was experimenting with the Rife machine effects on water because one of the ideas that I was trying to figure out how it was working at that time was that it must work on the water in the body because your water body contains so much water. It's water that holds everything together. And in particular, it's the geometries in the water. So when you look at how the DNA is structured itself, they often talk about the spiral and the held together and how it twists and all this. But what nobody looks at is the water around the DNA and the water in the cells. And it's a very important part because all the water in your body is highly structured. Uh, when you talk about structured water, um, you know, a lot of people have different marketing uh, things where they process the water in certain ways and they say it's the structure in the water. Um, water is very dynamic. It's continuously making and breaking these uh, hydrogen bonds, you know, billions of times a second on every molecule. But what's interesting is when you get a particular element in ionic form that's suspended in the water, like in a colloidal solution, uh, that the water will structure around that particular element or whatever it is and it'll build cages like clathrite cages and these are all platonic solids so you can build dodecahedrons tetrahedrons are very common in water um, icosahedrons um, so all these shapes water is capable of doing that because the bond angle on there interestingly enough is 108 degrees at a normal uh, stationary Thing. So the, you picture your oxygen with your two hydrogens on there and that bond stretches. Water is a dipole so it has a positive and a negative charge uh, with the hydrogen and the oxygen and as it moves around it can get stretched and it's influenced by everything. Just putting this glass in front of the light of this projector it's now being influenced by that light and those geometries are changing just, just from that alone. So that 108 degrees, interestingly enough, if we look at the pentagram, so this is based on the 72 degree angle at the top of the pentagram, and if you got five of these sides around the pentagram going to the bottom, well, that bottom uh, one across there at the bottom of the pentagon is 108 degrees. So water is this perfect, uh, fits into the phi algorithm uh, perfectly. Now, those bond angles can stretch either way 15 degrees, which makes the water being able to fit into all those different geometries. And uh, I had a lot of questions. Water science has never been really fully understood, despite it being so simple. You would think we would have figured it out a long time ago, but we still are scratching the surface on it. And uh, a few years ago, Professor uh, Gerald Pollack 
uh, came out with this book, The Fourth Phase of Water. And uh, when I got that, uh, shortly after he published it, I was just blown away because in this book, he answers a lot of unknown questions that we just generally had in science. And it became very controversial because basically a lot of people you know, were stuck in their academic ways looking down one path. And when he started writing about this, it kind of blew a lot of people's uh, ideas of how they thought things worked <laughs> out of the water. So, I mean, the main part about science is to understand the, the fundamental workings of nature. And when it gets so dogmatic that it says, no, this is the way it is and this is a law, this is when you run into problems. It's no longer science anymore. It's, it's dogma. It's the same as, uh, you know, any kind of religion or anything like that that tries to force a particular idea on you. So, uh, it's great that science is slowly moving forward. I mean, there's an old saying that says science progresses one funeral at a time. So, yeah. it's kind of that idea. But um, So, if you get a chance to read this or see some of uh, Professor Pollock's uh, lectures on, online, they're, they're incredible and it's great. So, some people put in uh, containers of water yeah. in the middle and then yeah. drinking? Yeah, exactly. So, that's yeah. one of the things we'll do is uh, put a vessel of water in the center, right in the sweet spot. And vortex it again because you'll get a good imprint on there. It uh, likes to, water likes to move, and if you keep it moving, especially in those uh, spiral uh, patterns, it really gets heavily influenced uh, by by that. So these things, the slide here proves. Yeah. The fact that the so we really wanted to see what was going on. So one of the top water researchers in the world, Dr. Glenn Ryan. Uh, <laughs> We had him come out to our last uh, conference in, in France and, and uh, had him do some tests in his laboratory. And he found there's actually a 44% increase in electroconductivity in the water that's sitting in the, in the therify. And it happens very quickly, within three minutes of being in the field. Um, so he uh, specializes in DNA and, and water. He's a biochemist and a senior researcher and uh, just an amazing guy. And if you look up some of his papers, he's written and he's been around for quite a while, been a part of the psychotronics associations and, and been a part of the water uh, <coughs> research groups. I, back in the 90s, I, was, I read a lot of his papers. And um, so that's really great. And now we're working with the DNA to see the Therify's influence on, on the DNA. Uh, so in January, we're gonna have some uh, exciting uh, announcements uh, coming up on that. And uh, the mitochondria, um, we're going to look at, be looking at the mitochondria because one of the ideas is that uh, the influencing on the mitochondria and speeding up uh, metabolism and creating more energy because a lot of people, it, the Therify does a balancing react. Remember I talk about homeostasis. so. It's funny when we come to New York and we do shows in New York and stuff and you get a lot of high tension people stressed and they're out doing their thing and everybody's going somewhere and getting there really fast and they'll come in, sit down and they're fine. They're like, all right, I got three minutes, I can do it, let's go. And they jump on there and then they just poof, calm right down and then just go into this zen-like state. And a lot of people get off there and go, wow, I felt like I've been meditating for like hours on there. Three minutes, what, what is that? Uh, where there's the same time other people will come in, they'll have something like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and they're totally just whoa, low on energy. Uh, and they'll get off of the machine and feel refreshed and like, oh, I have energy and I feel uh, uh, good. So it does this balancing effect with the homeostasis. And one of the things we want to look at is the mitochondria. And there's a whole lot of interesting science is coming out on mitochondria uh, these days as we understand a little bit more. Um, I talk about it in some of my other talks, so I won't really get into it. Uh, uh, yeah, so another one of the things that I want to look at next after the DNA is neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Uh, absolutely, because when you look at the uh, how neurons fire, it's all electrical and, and the calcium and uh, exchange and all the things that are happening at the synapses. Uh, obviously, in that electrostatic field, your body is basically has all that electrical potential available to it. So it's increasing all those things. So I really want to look at uh, creating new uh, neurons, neurogenesis. 
uh, as well as creating neuroplasticity because one of our problems is as humans we're just re we repeat these patterns and everything in life repeats patterns and humans be, tend to be particularly uh, good at that and uh, so what happens in your brain is you get these uh, the dendrites all end up forming on what you do the, you know a way to change how these dendrites fire which they call neuroplasticity is to make different roots in your brain and you can do this by simple ways by uh, brushing your teeth uh, in a different way. You use your left hand instead of your right hand or driving to work uh, at a different route than you normally take because every single thing you do in life you're making this pattern and these patterns are continuously imprinted into your body uh, just like how we talk about frequencies imprint into the water and stuff like this. So neuroplasticity uh, is, is rechanging it and the more your neurons are capable of rewiring in your brain we know that when you get a concussion or something like that and destroys a particular area in, in your brain, the, the more neuroplasticity you have is the better that those neurons can reroute in order to, to come back to, to, to function. And this is part of the case in Alzheimer's and dementia and things like this. Those sure. strokes, those neural paths get damaged and because they were so set in their ways, they can't build new ones. So um, we've seen quite a influence of that in the therapy so that's one of the other areas I'm really interested in going into so a few people out there like uh, Claire in, in South Africa <coughs> has taken it on to do some experiments with uh, water and agriculture and just doing the <coughs> spinning water in the center of the tubes uh, found quite a increase in in plant growth and, and seed germination and uh, one of the things she mentioned in her little paper that she made up here was uh, plasma activated water and uh, so this potential of the plasma influencing the water is is more subtle in this way uh, but we'll get to it in a second how we've increased uh, how to affect the water uh, with the therify in, in a quite a dramatic way um, these uh, these roses were sent in um, by uh, Kristen from uh, Boston and she had these <coughs> in another room next to the Therify where uh, she was working with her clients. <coughs> so they're about 12 feet on the other side of the wall uh, from the Therify and she had let them dry up in the vase. These were dried up uh, flowers and when she got the Therify and started firing it up she found that these flowers started growing again and they got uh, new new growth on them. She was running the Therify at, at least twice a day for 10 minutes and uh, started noticing these new shoots coming out of the dried uh, flowers. So again when we talk about uh, time reversal and, and restoring the cells and increasing the growth rates and things like that, um, there's an example of just uh, people. So we kind of just put it out there. The Therify has kind of been like a an open project in that sense just to see what what's happening, what people are doing, what people are finding with it. And so these are some of the great results we've had. So I've talked about uh, for a while that the Therify is much more than just the, uh, a healing machine. <laughs> and uh, so this is the first uh, add-on basically to the Therify, it's called the Aquify and it basically uses uh, Vortex. Uh, Victor Schauberger was a, one of my heroes for many years of course working with water and um, so the Therify is our latest announcement and it's basically an add-on uh, for the Therify that you can uh, disconnect the tubes and take the plasma and inject the plasma directly into a vortexing water. Uh, so it consists of uh, basically a, a toroidal uh, sphere is like um, the same kind of top load that you would have on a Tesla coil. It, it basically acts as a capacitor um, with a golden mean uh, spiral copper wire that comes down into the center of the vortex inside of this uh, stainless steel uh, sink basically so we can create a nice uh, vortex in there and put the plasma field right into the eye of the storm in the vortex essentially. And uh, what it's doing some very interesting uh, things to the water and 
you can look online and see some of the research that's been done because uh, recently a lot of people are, are talking about this in, in, uh, in academia because it's producing very uh, strange effects in the water. Water uh, and electricity, even though they say water and electricity don't mix, uh, a lot of magic happens when you supercharge water. Um, as I've been saying for years, it's uh, water is basically uh, a plasma itself. And when you look at how plasma works, and you remember I was saying how the electrons strip off, uh, that the kind of thing is happening in the water all, all the time. Uh, and what's happening when you have an air plasma on the surface of the water, one of the reasons why you see the purple glow off the Tesla coils and things like this is because it's ionizing the air and the air is mostly nitrogen and that nitrogen ionizes and that's what gives you the purple that's the wavelength of nitrogen and a spectrum uh, analysis so you actually see that uh, corona it's been called you know St. Elmo's fire the corona all these things interesting names that we've come up with it's always has spiritual context to it uh, uh, dealing with royalty and the crown and the corona and all these things. We've always known that there's a spiritual element to it and you can look at you know references to it in uh, the Bible. You have biblical things like Moses and the burning bush and all these kind of things. When, when you see pictures of uh, uh, enlightened beings like the Buddha and stuff, he has the glowing halo around his head. I'm looking for oh, one. In, in Taoism uh, and then in paintings with saints and Jesus and stuff, they'll have a halo, the halo that glows, the, the glows, because they've absorbed, they've got the, the chi, the vital energy, they've, they've worked to, to master, the, to gather as much energy, so much so that they're actually emitting photons, they're lighting up like a glow, and you, you don't have to be uh, particularly sensitive to see it when you meet one of these enlightened beings, and even the word enlightenment uh, is you have, because your body is a vessel, it's a light body, and you can contain more light. And they've shown this, and your DNA captures photons and keeps photons resonating down the center of light. So if you shoot a photon into your DNA, it becomes captured, and uh, the DNA, the more photons that it can hold, and they've even measured, you know, you could be sitting in this chair when you get up and leave after I've been sitting here for the last hour or so. There are photons that are left behind from my body that will stay there for hours, maybe days afterwards. So when we talk about, you know, ghosts and uh, things like this and seeing other uh, things and when you walk into a room and somebody's had an argument in there and you feel that energy, right? Those kind of things. So that's how uh, light uh, uh, works and so what's happening in, in the air is because this highly ionized charge is pulling the nitrogen and the water is absorbing it like a magnet. This, this device is really cool because when you, uh, when you get near it, so you see it's just the, the same box that's underneath the bed there strapped onto the side of the barrel. The barrel's filled with water and it's just water circulating. But as you walk up to this thing, first thing you notice is that you smell it in the air. You smell like the spring fresh rain or like you're at the bottom of a waterfall. So, you know, all the Taoist masters and stuff, they would find these energy points and then you do Tai Chi, Qigong, all these things to harvest that energy. Well, this device is literally just spewing it. If you fired it up in this room right now, everybody's hair will stand on end. So as you get close to it, that's what you notice first. When your hair starts to stand on end, that's because of the charge. Your body's absorbing that charge and your hair are like little antenna that are just like receiving and transceiving the charge, right? And as you get this close to it, you know, your hair is standing on end, you really smell it, you start to feel it. You feel your whole body because it's creating a huge field within this, uh, it's creating a, a toroid, like this big toroid is on here. So picture the two tubes is basically the sink and the top toroid. So you've got the sloshing going back and forth here now. And for me, when I get this close to it, I start to see this shimmer. It's kind of like the veil in this reality starts to get loose. So there's going to be a lot of really interesting uh, things that come out of the aquify. Uh, no, no, no. Here's the caveat. You can drink the water that's in a glass vessel or however you're putting in between with the distance of the tubes. 
Unfortunately, you cannot drink this water because what's happening to this water is something very interesting. It's taking the nitrogen out of the air and it's fixing it into the water. So the first thing that happens is the pH starts dropping quite dramatically. You can drop the pH down to like two and a half, three. Uh, what's going on there? So you the test it. It's nitric acid that's being formed. That's where the pH is, is changing down there because it's pulling in so much and it's just hydrogen, nitrogen is, is making nitric acid in there. So it becomes a very low pH. But you're also getting nitrates in there, which is interesting too. So depending on what other uh, elements are in that water and the dissolved minerals, uh, all of a sudden all these nitrates are formed. So what happens when you take these this water now and put it on plants. So yeah, we can't drink it. But what you can do is you water your plants, all of a sudden your plants go ballistic and they start increasing growth rate, they increase all their uh, leaf, the foliage and the flowers, um, seed germination, because it's the charge that you put your seeds in there. Uh, you might have 50% of your seeds would sprout, uh, now like 90% of them will sprout after they've been affected by the water. Uh, the so it could be a natural way of getting nitrogen back into the soil. Yeah, rather than ammonia. E exactly. Yeah, so traditional are, fertilizers, are very expensive, uh, expensive and a huge industry that we might just put a little dent in and we'll see what happens here. But if you think about it, this is how nature does it. When lightning strikes in a field, you know, one of the things farmers always say, oh, they get this huge uh, fungal growth and they get rings of mushrooms will grow around there and it fixes the nitrogen in the soil. They know that, right? So all of a sudden everything in the soil flourishes because it's been supercharged, especially the fungi and the bacteria and everything like that. Now what's interesting is this will sterilize the water too. If you have uh, contaminated water, it's going to kill off a lot of bacteria. So you don't want to drink it for that reason. And, and for another reason, another compound that it makes in the water is nitrogen dioxide which is pretty nasty stuff. Um, you don't want to get that into your body. If you in inhale that, you, it slowly jumps onto your red blood cells and, and blocks them from absorbing oxygen. And if you get a long enough exposure, uh, you'll eventually starve of your body of oxygen and you die in three days if you inhale them out of it. It's like almost as bad as hydrogen sulfide or something like that. So, so don't drink that water. However, the plants just love it. So what you do is you water the plants and you you eat the plants, and then you'll get the maximum benefits from it. So this would be a, a biodynamic fertilizer. Absolutely, and it's totally natural, right? So it's like an organic uh, fertilizer. And so what you're doing here is emulating nature. So I consider myself a philosopher of nature. That's what I always said. I, I'm like Victor Schauberger was one of my heroes, and you know he just said, just absorb, na observe nature and emulate nature. And this is where it gets into biomimicry. And this is where we have to go as, as in order to save ourselves from ourselves, mm -hmm. is that we have to stop going against nature uh, and start going with nature and using that, these natural processes and in, integrate them into our way we do things. Would this destroy the, the Roundup that's in water and in plants and <coughs> just eat the plants in us? Yeah. We can talk about that after. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it would be able to destroy Roundup, would it? Yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to go to the pub after. <laughs> <laughs> you can filter Roundup out of drinking water, if that's what's going on. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, no, glyphosate well, stays. Negates, uh, it, uh, I don't think it's going to negate it. Yeah, it's the, the thing about that. Uh, Roundup and, and glyphosate and these chemicals that it's made out of is they stay in the soil for four years after application and then it's water soluble. So this is one of the biggest problems we have right now. It's one of the biggest environmental pollutants we have. It could very well be the key to a lot of diseases. It wipes out our intestinal flora. Uh, it's in everywhere. It's in this glass of water that I'm drinking here, even though it came from that bottle or the tap or whatever, I don't care. It's so in our environment right now, we're inundated with it. You know, we spray the crops with them to, to desiccate the crops at the end before we harvest it to produce, and you got in cereals, it's in every, all the food supplies, heavily contaminated with it. So the is it doesn't break down easily. What can we do to change that? Mm -hmm. What we can do is start using more natural methods because you don't need glyphosate anymore when you have this water. You can spray this water literally on the plants because it's so highly charged. 
it the plants get highly charged by it and you can ha you, if you could see the plant's aura and some people who have this kind of capability they will look at a plant that's been watered with a uh, aquify water and one that hasn't and they'll say wow does that have life force it's literally glowing and this is what the insects see they see in all these other spectrums and that's how the insects are attracted to it in fact that's part of the flowers process when the flower is loaded up with pollen and honey it gives off different colors or a nectar so the bees know the bees just look at the flower and go no there's nothing left there somebody else got it and as soon as they're recharged again they just shift their color spectrum bee goes oh yeah here we go uh, so what the insects do is the bad insects look at that and go, well, I don't need to eat that plant. The insects are eating the plants because the plants are weak. It's like everything in nature. Life feeds on life. And it's like the wolves that will take out the weakest uh, deer in the herd or whatever, right? The, the insects won't go after the strong plants, but with the good bugs will. So the ladybugs are like, I want to land on that plant. We're going to have a good time. And the bees and, and then all the bad bugs, the aphids and things like that, are just going to stay away. So now you're just going to spray this on your thing. So this is the solution. This is what I say. We need to just emulate nature and make, create vitality everywhere. Uh, and then that's our solution to pollution, well, not dilution. I, I mean, personally, I'm very excited about yeah. this innovation yeah. because it's part of the possible, you know, with other it's huge. Yeah. that can, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. organic so you, technologies and so forth. Exactly. You got the triple whammy because you got the frequencies of the therify imprinted in the water as well, right? Yeah. Remember that water is absorbing everything. So now you got the golden mean, uh, you know, the, the frequency algorithms, you got the nitrogen from the air, and you have the charge. That's the important thing. The thing is, if you can, it, it, you know, with farmers, if, if you can come along with a tangible, you know, economic way of organic farming, that, that, they'll change straight away, you know, if the bottom line is there. One of them that has always been around, you know, the whole thing of pesticides and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I think you know where I'm going with this conversation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's up that it's up to us to innovate and create alternatives to yeah. farmers, so that they they get the picture and they can they can see the economics and they'll they'll make changes straight away. They'll they'll get away yep. from Roundup if yep. you can give them a, a solid, tangible alternative. Exactly. And this is a piece yeah. of the puzzle. Exactly. Absolutely. It's a, a big, piece of the puzzle. complicated so puzzle. Ninety percent of farming is ConAgra and two other companies. Yeah, but don't forget that people are aware of Roundup now. The highest concentrations of Roundup are in the, you know, the Mississippi, and they have the highest cancer rates in America. And this, mm -hmm. this information is getting out to America now. Yep. And it won't be long before those companies are going to wake up and go, oops, you know, yep. sorry, yep. and they need to make radical changes. You know? yep. Well, you look at what they did with DDT. They'll shift it to somebody that doesn't know. They're like, oh, they got wise to us here, and they'll go and peddle it off in some other country. So that might happen for a little bit. That's why you it's, don't drink wine from Chile. Yeah. They use DDT. Yeah. It, it, it's already, you know, we've, we've seen it in the past. But ho oh, hopefully, hopefully what technologies do like this, if we can grow this, you know, spectacular food that's highly energetic, and everybody, you know, we've been talking for a long time about conscious evolution of mankind. Uh, hopefully the more of these technologies that get out there will have this uh, morphogenic grid effect and it'll just cascade from one person to another, which is, um, which is kind of what I've been working on, is passing on that message. And, and I think there's a lot more people aware of this stuff. 20 years ago, I used to talk to people about these things and the rife machines and stuff. They're like, woo, he's a kook. That's way out there. That's pseudoscience. It's voodoo. They, that, that doesn't exist. But nowadays, you talk to anybody about frequencies and resonance and even these kind of things, they're, they're, they're on it, right? I know you guys are on it. You wouldn't be here. But uh, it's, it, it's part of the 100th monkey thing. The more uh, conscious, the more we realize it, then it, it has a ripple effect. Uh, and that's a big part of what, what's going on now. Paul, what other uh, uses of this water exist yeah. fertilizer? Yeah, okay, so it can also clean up water. So you can put contaminated water and you can run it through this. And we've been doing this for a long time with uh, electrolysis and putting plates in water. Uh, ozone's quite common. Uh, UV, you know, everybody has a UV 
uh, light and they put them in their hot tubs and swimming pools and things like this to clear all bacteria. So at this stage, you don't want to have, you, there's a fine balance where you want, uh, the, you, it's like your body, you want to keep the good bacteria, the healthy, the microflora that, that's running the show really, <laughs> um, strong and you want the bad bacteria out. It wasn't the old idea where germs are bad and we had to just kill everything so we made antibiotics. Pharmaceutical companies, we, we made the same mistakes too. We went down the wrong road. We were just like, kill everything. It was the same thing that the farmers were doing. We just kill all that bad stuff that's in the fields. Well, they didn't realize that there's bad stuff and good stuff and the good stuff just as, and it, this started a, a long time ago, the platonic solids you know, were uh, kept a secret, and it was only like the secret uh, mystery schools that understood them. The platonic solids all fit together, uh, and they nest together, and they're uh, recursive, so they can repeat this pattern. And the golden mean does that. The golden mean is the most efficient path to get there, and it's really just a ratio. It's a ratio of one to 1.618039 ad infinitum. It's a it's a uh, irrational number that just goes on and on forever in the 10 base system. Uh, but what that means basically is that it's a pattern that nature follows. We see it everywhere. So in the digits on my hand, this unit of one, uh, the next unit is 1.618. It's a ratio of one to 1.618, and that repeats. This is 1.618 times this one. And this is 1.618 of this. And you know, it approximates it. Everything in nature is, is very close, but we see it over and over and over again in all these patterns. So the, the classic Nautilus shell, when you see that seashell that's kind of cut in half, that uh, follows that golden mean. And there's another number sequence called the Fibonacci sequence that shows that, right? So you just go one plus one, is two and two plus one is three and you just add up those numbers and it goes so far but it bounces back and forth around that uh, golden mean. It's, it's everywhere in the universe and the, bo the human body is using it. Plants, plants using it. water. Can you specify exactly how it's used in the therapy? Yeah, device? well I, as I did that the tubes are in that golden mean from the base to the uh, angle on the, on, the, on the side of the cones uh, it's in the algorithm uh, is based on Planck's length, which is a, is a very small number of a quanta. It's one of the smallest units of measure that we use in quantum physics the, to measure things like the orbital shells on, a, on an atom. And so the golden mean is combined with that in Dan's algorithm that he based the book on in the, in the Therify frequencies. Um, it's also in uh, the way the coils uh, wound. It's, it's integrated in, in several things, in the geometry on the shapes, it's in the logo, it's, it's, it's all hidden all throughout it. Because when you use it... It's the way you collapse the two, you know, one's clockwise, one's anticlockwise. It's yeah. the golden mean ratio is the key to it. Conserving... Collapse that centripetal force right yep. down to the DNA. You're using the golden yeah. mean ratio. Yeah, it's the and only way to do that. it is. It's a door, and it's a way of conserving charge. Nature uses it because it's the most efficient way to make things. And this is what how the negative entropy comes about that we talk about, is that nature is is continuously. It's both building and destroying. Everything goes through these cycles, right? Uh, but the very nature is kind of lazy in that sense, where it wants to use the most efficient means to get the best structure. So like an egg is a phi ratio from the top to the side and then the curves on it. And it just happens to be one of the strongest shapes to be able to uh, do all kinds of things as well as a perfect shape to grow uh, the chick inside uh, to hatch from. When the bees make uh, the beehives, there's golden mean in there. Uh, when they lay a queen cell, the, all the other cells are sort of hexagonal uh, and they lay all the other uh, drones in the and the females in those cells. But when they make a queen, they make a perfect egg shape again uh, and, and do it in there. So you just, you see that uh, pattern uh, everywhere. And, and, and it's a great uh, way of learning and an excellent exercise for children. The more uh, 
involved you can get children to look at the platonic solids and to actually build these shapes, uh, the more uh, conscious they become. So, yeah. It's a, and it's a big uh, rabbit hole, so <laughs> enjoy. Yeah. Well, we have a curriculum called the Academy of Sacred Geometry, guys. That's where right. We, for, for decades, we've been exploring, you know, the, the, the whole theme of the Golden Mean Ratio. We've had lots of teachers coming to New York to teach the whole theme of sacred geometry and all these ratios of nature. And you can always uh, get a little bit of that overview on academysacredgeometry.com. But um, Paul, it's a brilliant uh, uh, evening, a wonderful Great. presentation. I don't, I don't know if there's any more questions for tonight. And uh, you know, we can all enjoy some more wine. And, and I think Paul deserves a drink. Sure. And a round yeah, that's right. Well, hang on. Thank you. Don't, don't forget, folks, that Paul is here in New York tomorrow. And we're doing a talk at the Alchemist Kitchen Collective down at the Lower East Side. There's information on the table and you can speak to Indira about the, the talk on Lyme's disease. So tomorrow we're micro-studying a particular um, pathogen and uh, bringing in the, you know, the whole protocol of the Therify device and the diet and the herbs and, and all of that. So that's tomorrow morning from 10 o'clock to 12. And, and then- we're also selling packages. Yeah, there, there'll be some deals done. Yeah, if you want to even do that tonight. Yeah, you can speak to Indira. Are you going to take and, 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 then, and, then, and then tomorrow afternoon, we're back here in this room. So t tomorrow morning, Lower East Side, the dress is here with Indira. But then tomorrow afternoon, 2.30 to 5, it's a different theme. It's advanced energy systems. So we're broadening out the... Uh, you know, discussion and, uh, about technologies using you know, golden mean ratio, Therify, Equify, uh, Nikola Tesla, um, and uh, coal fusion, and you, you name it, we're sort of covering the Hot whole fusion. Of, sport <laughs> of technology. So that's 2.30 to 5 o'clock here to, uh, tomorrow afternoon. And that's pretty much the program. Any questions about yeah, that, folks? Roger, yeah. Are you going to be taping the uh, the session on Lyme disease, and will that be available for yeah, patients? Pretty much. We have, we've got um, Al here. Uh, we, we are taping all of the three sessions. Yeah. And yeah. if you're on the Therify database, so you can you know join up tonight. Pretty sure we'll get that up on you know YouTube because I've just done a whole series of webinars and. Um, I'm kind of in the, the mode of getting things up on, uh, on YouTube, you know, before I leave for Sydney. So I would say within a, in a week, we'll have that up on YouTube. So our intention is to actually film the three components and, and get them up there. And I will send out the link to everybody so you can view it again. I understand that not everybody can make the, you know, tomorrow. So we'll, we'll try to do that. Hey, guys, thanks for coming. And, uh, you know, have a drink with us. All right. <laughs> Alcohol tastes a little superior <laughs> in the therapeutic field. Pyramids. <laughs> I'm using pyramids. Oh, okay, so yes. Yep. Every time I put them in, I put like one of Ben's arm lines. Yeah. Yeah. It's just.